Welcome to Give a Heck. I am your host, Dwight Heck, and for much of my life, lived my life in quiet desperation, wondering how I was going to pay the bills, take vacations, save for retirement, and one day wondering if I would get off the hamster wheel of life and have purpose. A life that most of society lives, which takes us to work, then home, then repeat, and pays us hopefully enough just to survive. The harsh truth that most live with more months than money and have no idea how to live life on purpose, not by accident. This ensures the mass majority are living not just financially broke, however emotionally and mentally as well due to financial pressures. In each episode, I will introduce you to thoughts, ideas, and guests that can help you to learn how you too can live life on purpose, not by accident. Good day and welcome to Give a Heck. On today's show, I welcome Will Kintish. Will qualified as a chartered accountant in 1971 and was in general practice for the next 30 years. At the start of the 21st century, he changed his career and since then has shown thousands in the academic, professional, and financial communities how to become more effective and confident networkers. Networking is fundamental to one's success, yet so many people fear this activity. Will shows you how to overcome all your fears and concerns when working the room, how to spot lots of potential opportunities, and how to follow up in a professional manner. He is a fellow of the Professional Speaking Association, the highest accolade available in the speaking profession. Whether he runs workshops, speaks online to the computer, or gives keynote speeches, he communicates with a passion, enthusiasm, and lots of humor. He is the author of Business Networking, The Survival Guide, How to Make Networking Less About Stress and More About Success. Since COVID, he is now presents to global audiences, showing them how they can become effective networkers in a virtual world. I'd like to welcome you to the show, Will. Thanks so much for agreeing to come on and share with us some of your life journey. Thanks, Dwight. Thanks for inviting me. I look forward to some of your questions. I hope I can answer them, because if I can't, I'm in big trouble. I'm pretty sure you can. Um, just with our prior conversations, prior to the recording of this, I'm uh, quite confident that we're going to have a great conversation and that uh, you'll be able to articulate yourself quite well. So, well, one of the things I like to focus on is a person's origin story. And the reason for that is, as a person, you know, throughout my life, I, I'm a movie buff. And Marvel and Star Wars have done a great job of doing movies, but they always tend to start in the middle of the story and they don't do the origin until years later. And I noticed that resoundingly was happening in the podcast industry. And if you look at before podcasting, it was happening in the television and radio industry when they did interviews, they always wanted a backstory that started from, you know, you were broke. You were struggling, couldn't pay your bills, and you started your company or you started your career. And, you know, that doesn't tell me enough about the individual. And I like to understand people's origin from when they were a child to adulthood. So could you please tell me your origin story from your earliest recollections up to today that led you where, you know, obviously what you've currently uh, are doing to help people? I got, um, I got to the age of 11. My father was a tailor. He worked for my Auntie Beck. Auntie Beck was the matriarch of the family. There were eight children. Auntie Beck ran a furrier business. You wouldn't run it today, Dwight, because real furs, and of course, real furs are unacceptable. But the Kintish family had a very, very successful business. And my father worked for Auntie Beck as a tailor. He repaired fur coats and he remodeled them and he cleaned them. And that was my father. My mother was a bookkeeper. And I was looked after very well. And we got to the age of 16 and a tragedy struck because my mother died of cancer. I'm reckoning that today she probably would have survived because the advancement of uh, science in, uh, in cancer is such that she probably would have got through, but no, she didn't. So I'm 16 years old. 
My sister is 13, but interestingly enough, my father is 60. So it's like two generations between me and my father. And when you were 60 in those days, Dwight, you were 60. Today, when you're 60, you're 40, if that makes sense. Because people have got a different attitude in uh, the older life. And I'm 73. So at 16, in the UK, we have a very important moment in our academic life where we do something called GCSEs, which decides whether we're going to, into high school and then on to university. I didn't do very well in my GCSEs, so I got invited into the headmaster's study and Mr. Hanforth at Berry Grammar School, Berry is a town just three miles north of Manchester where I live, he, Mr. Hanforth said, Kintish, you're not very clever really, are you? I think you ought to leave and go and get a job. What am I gonna do, sir, I said. He said, the only thing you're quite good at is math or maths as we call it here in the UK. Go and be an accountant. And that was the only career advice I was given, Dwight, go and be an accountant. And I came out of the study. My father, unfortunately, wasn't able to guide me. My mother was always the guide in our family. And he just shrugged. And the next week I was working for Uncle Jerry. Uncle Jerry was an accountant. I qualified as a chartered accountant, or I think in North America it's called CPA, Certified Public Accountant. And I did that for the next 30 years until I was 52. But when I was 50, I was getting a bit bored with that. And for a hobby, I started to train as a trainer with an organization organized by Dale Carnegie. I, I hope our listeners have heard of Dale Carnegie. He wrote the most famous book called How to Win Friends and Influence People. So during the day I was being an accountant in 1998, 99, and uh, for a hobby I was training as a trainer because I, I loved Dale Carnegie's principles, and then in the year 2000, my accountancy firm got taken over by a big national firm. And they said to me a few months later, Will, you're not happy here, are you? I said, I'm not. They said, I'll tell you what, if we give you some money, will you go away? Go and set up your own business. I said, well, it depends how much money you gave me. And they made me an offer. I came home to Mrs. Kintish. And, uh, you know, wives are like Dwight. They always say, well, that's not enough. So I went back and said, I want some more, please. And they gave me some more. So on the 1st of June in the year 2000, I left accountancy to start Kintish Networking Skills, a training business. And that's what I've been doing ever since. So on May 31st this year, I'll be 21 years old. Kintish Networking Skills will be 21. So for 20 years of those 21 years, Dwight, I was showing people how to work a room. And since March 2000, when Mr. and Mrs. COVID appeared, I now show people how to work the Zoom. And that's it. I've basically been a one-trick pony for 21 years. Because the great thing about my topic is that everybody who has a career or a job needs to become an effective and competent networker if they want to get on. I mean, let's be honest, there's a lot of people who just want to do a job. They want to collect their wages in the middle of the month or the end of the month and go home. And that's fine. And I've got no problem with that. But people who want to get up that ladder of success, whatever that means, they have to be visible and they have to be proactive. And that's what networking is all about. So here I am in May 2021. Now the things are getting, I won't say back to normal, but the inquiries are coming in and I'm now showing people how to become effective online networkers. So there you go. In about five minutes, I've given you my 73 years of life on this earth. Thank you. I appreciate that. Obviously, there's lots, lots in between that little nuances, but uh, a very great story i appreciated that listening to you talk about um you know your your family and what they went through working in the fur industry and as you mentioned that's not 
that's frowned upon today, but back then it was a reality, right? So um, it's interesting, your dad being a tailor and your mom being a bookkeeper, how families have polar opposites in, in what they do, because there's a real, real tie to somebody that's cleaning and repairing or tailoring furs to somebody doing bookkeeping. So would you say that when you, when you became an accountant or the teacher directed you toward becoming an accountant, did it come into your mindset about your mom being a bookkeeper? Did that ever intrigue you? Was it ever, ever anything that, that in, was an encouragement for you? Because now your mom has been passed away for a while, but did you like the fact that she was a bookkeeper? Do you recall anything as a kid about that? that? It was, that's, that's very interesting uh, connecting those dots there. That's why it's the dad's never ever thought about it until now oh just you know, curious you're, you're, you're six you're 16 years old you're told to be an accountant you've got no guidance from anywhere you're, you're offered a job at four pound a week which was probably what five and a half dollars or something like that and that was it and i began to enjoy it and that's probably why i did it for all those years i didn't even think about it oh, okay. i just did it just did it Here's why I think of the tie-in. My dad was a very successful business owner. Back then, back in, it would have been, oh goodness, now I got to think about it. Would have been in the 50s, late 50s, early 60s. He, uh, in our country, they had, you could go to university and you could get a degree, but they also had colleges, just business colleges, where you could go get your entry level and get your accounting diploma not your chartered accountant or your CPA, they call it today. You had that correct, by the way. Um, it used to be chartered accountant, but they got rid of that and put a label on everybody calling them a CPA. They had to go through specific uh, you know, courses and, and schooling, but he became an accountant. And I remember growing up with him and he took that ability. He worked at a car dealership, worked for a concrete plant, built, it built cinder blocks, and then he... He had an urge to have his own business, got into his own business. And for the 30 some years, he had biz had a business, a farm equipment business. He did all his own book work and he'd get me to do some of the, he'd hand me columns and columns of numbers. And here's your old adding machine. First I had to want to crank and then a, a, ooh, I, got oh an electric, I got an electric one. <laughs> I was like, whoa, electric. And it was so loud because there was a motor in there, that word. It and, was, absolutely. But that's, but that's, it, I love talking about, I love hearing when people talk about their origin story, because it also brings back really fond memories for me, right? Of my dad and some of the things that he taught me. And I thought when I was a kid, I wanted to be an accountant. So that's why I brought it up. <laughs> oh, and, wow. and, I, and I went through, I started looking at out of going through, you know, high school thinking maybe I wanted to be an accountant. And it was because of my dad's influence. And the fact of how his origin started from being a farm kid to going to business school, to getting his accounting diploma, to going forward. So thank you for striking up a memory for me. Oh, that's why yeah. I asked. The, the interesting thing is, the, I've got three kids. They're all grown up now. In fact, it's my daughter's 45th birthday today. Oh, Joanne. Wow. Yeah, well, I'm an old man. So, you know, I've got old kids. Um, you're not old. You're seasoned. Stop saying that. Okay, tell, pe seasoned. tell people I'm not. I'm not old. I'm 73 I'm years seasoned. seasoned. Yes, seasoned. I'm seasoned. I'm, I'm using it. I'm seasoned. <laughs> um, so the only, like your dad, the only advice I gave to my three kids. So I have a daughter, Joanne, and two boys who I'll tell you about in a moment. The only advice I gave to them was, if you don't know what to do, kids, qualify as an accountant because it gives you that business foundation to because everything's about business. So what happened? My daughter said, dad, I'm never going to be an accountant. And you know what do I, she ended up as an accountant. She did accountancy for about 15 years. And then she started producing some of my grandchildren. And now she's a math teacher and absolutely loves it. Works in a, an expensive girls school in London and just absolutely loves being a math teacher. But the other two, the middle child, Michael, Michael was very, very clever. He went to Oxford University, uh, got a very, very good degree. 
I'm sure our readers, know, our listeners know about Oxford University, creme de la creme, Yale, Harvard, Oxford and Cambridge. So he did French and German. He also got something called two blues. A blue is an honor you get if you represent Oxford at a particular sport. And he got two Oxford blues for playing football. So he was brilliant at soccer, football. He got a fabulous degree in modern languages and then announced, I'm going to be a pop star. I'm going to be a, uh, yeah, I'm going to be a pop star. Well, it was just that same time, Dwight, that I was leaving accountancy and following my dream because I realized how much I loved presenting. So I could hardly say to Michael, no, Michael, you've got to follow in my footsteps or go and be a lawyer or a doctor or, or a dentist. And you know what? That's 20 years ago because he started being a musician. He did, he did the performing for about a year and a half, but now he's a songwriter, a composer and a record producer, and he's doing terrifically. He's got record... Uh, the great thing about the music industry now, of course, it's digital. So he's got hits all over Europe with his songs. Millions and millions of downloads. He's had various awards. And, and uh, so he can put food in the fridge with no problem whatsoever. That's awesome. <clears throat> that's that's, that's so, a, it's amazing. It is good. And the third child, he always played Lego. I presume that Canada has got Lego. So... He always was playing with bricks and building things. And now he owns his own property or realtor company. So he's at the moment, if our listeners are interested in moving to London, he's got seven luxury apartments available in Northwest London, selling for between 700 and 900,000 pounds. Not Canadian dollars. Well, that's how much apartments cost in London. Yeah. So uh, that's my third child. So wow. yeah, they've done well. I'm very proud. You know, people say, what are you most proud of? I say, number one, being married to Mrs. Kintish for 50 years. And number two, having three, uh, three kids who are, I think, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, accomplished. Successful. They're very yeah, accomplished. accomplished. But successful. All of them are involved in voluntary work and charity work. And in other words, they're giving back to society. And I don't have to tell you that that is probably the most important aspect of a person's life is giving. Oh, and absolutely. Service to others is, is imperative. Absolutely. absolutely imperative. So yeah, that's, that's, uh, I like hearing that about your, your kids and, and you're being proud of them. I, I tease and joke when I go on podcasts or I'm having conversations with people and they, What's the most thing you're proud of? I said, well, I got five kids. I'm proud none of them are in jail. So, <laughs> okay. right? so, right. That's the first point. That's the first start. Then anything after that is like cherry yeah, on top. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, but I, I've got to announce, I also have seven grandchildren ranging from 15 down to about five. So uh, and, and Congratulations. We, have major, we have a major, major move coming up. We live in Manchester, as I've said, which is, do we, tell me something. In Canada, do we do we travel in miles or kilometers? We're kilometers. The only place in the world that uses uses Imperial is the U.S. We've been right. we've we've been we've been well. We're a Commonwealth country, as you know, right? We've been metric. Um, I was in grade. I want to say grade four, grade five. So probably seventy. I want to say seventy six, maybe seventy eight, somewhere around there. We went to the metric system. So I'm well versed in both though, right? Because I started out Imperial, gravitated to, to the metric system. And yeah, so good question. So, well, so we're, um, we finally decided we're going to up sticks and leave Manchester and go and live in London. So uh, only today we phoned the, what we call estate agents, what you call realtors to put the house on the market and uh, we're going to move 300 kilometers or 200 miles south to London to be nearer our kids and grandkids. That is the plan this year. 
Well, it's good. You know what? For me, I live on three principal core values, faith, family, and work. Um, work is the last of the three. And because without the other two, it's meaningless to me, right? When I'm happy within my faith and my family, I serve others better within my work too, right? So to me, there it's impossible to have a balance of life where it's equal, but you, it doesn't mean you can't strive to have the areas that are most important in you within some form of balance. Right. So I appreciate you saying that I have, um, four grandkids. Um, so yeah, I appreciate the fact that life is about being with family and the memories. So I've conditioned myself every time I see my grandkids, which hasn't been as much, you know, obviously through the pandemic and lockdowns, when I see my own adult kids, every time I consciously, dict in my mindset and I journal, I do a vlog. I talk about things every single day. I've been doing a vlog for over 440 some days now. I haven't missed a video log that I do every day, but for me, it's about memory. So I take everything very serious when I'm dealing with people and I, and I log that I don't want it to lose its indexing. So I forget that memory. Right. So I can appreciate that and respect that a lot that you want to be around your family and grandkids. So you see that? Yeah. This is a five-year diary. From the age of 14 until I was 21, I kept a diary every day. Look, can you see the words? Oh, it? yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hundreds can see. and hundreds of words. So I've got my whole teenage life, every single day from 14 till I was 21, uh, recorded. And, wow. uh So I bring it out on occasions and... Because my friends that we have here in Manchester have been friends for over 50 years. So I can go back into the diary and say, do you know what we all did on May the 18th in the year 1966? And I can tell them what we did because we were all together then. That let, me go awesome. back, let me go back to something about sure. family. Only yesterday we, we, dis, we had a, a meeting with our financial advisor because we, you probably don't know this, but the, the price of, property in London is like nearly double the price of property in Manchester. So we're going to have to dig in deep into our savings to buy something in London. And also it'll probably, well, I know for a fact, it will be half the size and twice the price. So we saw our financial advisor only two days ago, and he then wrote to me afterwards. He said, you realize you're very brave, aren't you? I said, brave. And I phoned him up. I said, why are we brave? He said, well, most people of your age downsize and they, they want to uh, downsize their property and want to reduce their costs. Whereas you are doubling the size of your property and you're obviously going to have increased costs. And my retort to him was, it's not always about the money. If we can spend time with the family where we don't have to make a big song and dance of getting on the train or getting in the car. We'll be there. We'll be able to see them every weekend. He didn't have anything to say about that. Yeah, that's so a great, great response family, to him. Families will make new friends down there. In fact, interestingly enough, the catalyst that um, has got us to go down is two of our close friends have moved down as well for similar reasons. So we've already got the, uh, the start of a social network down there because we've already got friends down there. That's good, though. And that's another thing that I, I is quite, you know, for the listeners, it's quite obvious. You're, you're very much um, strategic and plan and, and understand that you, this is your goal, but you know the consequences of what you're going to do from moving from Manchester to London you've thought about it. And most people don't, they do things knee jerk without any form of planning. And the results are then what it's like gambling. You don't know, right? Every result we have in our life has some form of percentage of risk, but you can downgrade your risk listeners when you actually plan, when you actually put things into place. And if you're uncertain how to do it, it's called coaching and mentorship. Go find people that know how to do it ask them for help, receive that help and then apply it and move forward in life. Don't sit back and just try doing everything on your own, right? I said to the financial advisor, Dwight, 
we want this is our, what our house is worth i reckon we're going to need so much more to buy in london we've got pension funds and uh, ISAs and investments have we got enough money to live like we want to live and he crunched all the numbers and he said yes so we were very very careful in going through all the numbers before we even talked about moving because if i hadn't have got a pension pot i couldn't have afforded to go to london simple as that so yeah. you're absolutely right it's all about planning and preparation well you know what i i, I we never talked about it you know what i do though right i have a financial planning I'm practice i'm a, yeah, yeah. i have a, i have my own brokerage so i've been this is my 19th year so i can appreciate what you're saying that's but why i brought up the topic of uh, yeah. financial advisors yeah so i appreciate that so we're going to, you've talked a little bit about this, but I'm, I'm really curious type of person. And when I was reading up on you last night and putting in, I put a lot of effort into understanding as best I can from information, the people that I'm going to have on and have conversations with. Um, so at the start of the 21st century, you changed your career from being a chartered accountant and did a complete 180 and got into teaching people how to properly network. Was there a disconnect in the current industry that you were in? And their ability to network, had you experienced, does that have anything to do with um, your life change to become a networking teacher? There's a Jewish word, I'm Jewish, proud of it, Jewish word called Beshet, B-E-S-H-E-R-T. It means fate. It means it's meant to be serendipity. Beautiful word, I love it. In 1998, for a hobby, I started to train as a trainer, not knowing I was ever going to leave accountancy. And I'd been on the Dale Carnegie course 10 years earlier, and I loved their principles so much. That's why I decided in, in 98 if they had room for me as a part-time evening trainer once a week. And two years later the big accountancy firm that took us over said, Will, we'll give you this money and you can set up your own training company. So there was, there was no thought or thought about it. I thought, well, why not take a chance? They gave me enough money to live for the next two and a half years. And I thought, well, if I, don't, if I can't make it after that, then I'll have to go back to being a practicing accountant. And that was it. So there wasn't a lot of thought in it at all, Dwight. I just left and set it up. I mean, I look back now at some of the crazy things I did. In those days, in those days, there was very little email. We're going back 20 years. It's amazing what's happened. I used to spend, God knows where I got the money from, 20 or 30,000 pounds a year on direct mail. Not email, direct mail. But that paid off because networking as it is today was just coming into its own. Now, let's get something out of the way. Let's get the myths and nonsenses and mysteries out of networking. You, me, and everybody in the world since Adam and Eve, if we're going to talk a bit of uh, the good book, we've been networking ever since man and woman started to talk to each other. Networking is simply talking to each other with a view to building relationships. End of definition. That's all it is. So everybody's been networking always. It just wasn't, it, people just did it, whether they liked it or not. Everybody does it every day of their lives. If, if you get up, and you talk to people, you're networking. It's as simple as that. Now, there was an American called Dr. Ivan Meisner. In 19, 1988, Dr. Ivan Meisner set up an organization called BNI, Business Network International. He set it up in the Bay Area of San Francisco. He was having breakfast. He was a lawyer. He was having breakfast with an accountant and the banker and one or two others, and they set up this breakfast club. And he is classed as the father of modern day networking. Have you heard of BNI? No, I haven't. All right, well, the man sold out for billions a year or two ago. 
there will be, you look up, you will find a BNI in your town. There is a BNI in every town in the world nearly now. And they meet every week. So he started it. And so networking became a little bit more formal, a bit, a bit more organized. So I reckon I just hit at the right moment, starting to teach people how to network. I didn't even understand it myself. You tell me that you're a researcher, you prepare and plan a lot. So I start in 2000, base, not basically, with a blank piece of paper, thinking I'm going to teach people how to network. And that's what I did. And I built the business up from there. That's so, awesome, though. People yeah. need to under the listeners need to understand that because there's not always a correlation from our cur- our past careers to what we get into, but what? they wouldn't know that if I don't ask. And I'm an inquisitive person, so I wanted to know. And some people will say, well, yeah, this what happened at work. A boss did this, or I was in partnership in the business, or my I was by myself in my business, and this happened with a client. Like some of the stories are great, but even not having direct influence from your past career as a chartered accountant still is intriguing because it still leads to a story of, of you taking on risk and doing the direct, do the direct marketing, the amount of money you spent and your passion for, it was obvious or you wouldn't have done that. Right. So it's, it's amazing. One door closes, one door closes Dwight and another one opens and that's the share. You know, you just don't know what's going to happen. You talked about Dale Carnegie. 1993, I had a friend of mine. I owned a a business. I owned a computer company. I was a consultant. Had gone through, got my engineering diploma from one of the colleges here. And he handed me a book. I was married, just newly married. And he handed me a book. First book ever was given in regards to personal development and how to win friends and influence people. And I talk about it all the time because I get asked it. And what are, you, what are the first two books you ever experienced in personal growth? And was how to win friends and influence people and the magic of thinking big. And then shortly after that, Napoleon Hill, obviously. Um, and, you know, I listen to it and I look at the evolution of Dale Carnegie. And the reason I bring this up is the new version of it is called in the digital age. And it was updated by his children and by his, his uh, uh, foundation, okay. right? Yeah. So for the listeners, I just want to ensure you that it was a very profound book for me. And it is a great book that can teach you simple things as, as easy as understanding how to answer the phone, which is an initial stage of starting to network with somebody if it's brand new. So it's imperative read. It's not a hard read. I highly suggest it. Right. So we won't get too deep into it because I have some so many other things I'd like to ask you. But thank you for bringing up, Dale, one of my favorites of all time. Right. So um, I, I, I know you want to move on, but just yeah, go ahead. Second. Sure. Absolutely. He writes the book in nine. The book is published in 1936. Mm-hmm. If you think about that title, How to Win Friends and Influence People, he wrote the first book on networking. There was no mention of it whatsoever. But that was where I took my ideas from to create what I created. How to, that's what it is, simple. What a great, that. what a great mold though. What a great, <laughs> what a great, what a great uh, teacher. You know, God oh. rest his soul, but unbelievable what he did oh. for our world, right? And, and, you know, listeners, some of you are going to probably be smiling, some shaking your head because I bring this up. One of the best tools to understand how to communicate and build relationships for me, started with the Bible, right? So you look at the teachings of Christ or the teaching of the apostles or, you know, whatever you want to talk about regarding to the Bible, there's the influence started well before Dale Carnegie. And you listen to some of the most successful people, they talk about their influence from, you know, their religious background, not necessarily, you don't have to be a person that's Christian, you can be Jewish, you can be whatever, we all have our teachings and are that come from thousands of years ago right depending on obviously what faith i think, you he, I think it suggest the book suggests he was a practicing christian Dale yes Carnegie. oh absolutely he was yeah, absolutely he was. he was so i'm not trying to say that people that are atheist agnostic i respect and love everybody on the planet um bottom line though 
you know, we talk about Dale Carnegie, but the root of all of this started thousands of years ago. It just didn't start with Dale. Dale took, you know, he was blessed by God, right? To be a person that was going to change millions of people's lives now. You know, I look at somebody and I've started, I went on to one of his closed conferences, a virtual conference here recently, Jack Canfield. Man, that guy is just amazing, right? I spent three days, literally not even a month ago, um, just, you know, just his connection. And he talked about, and he's 77, and he talked a lot about um, his influences of, you know, being, of, of how God influenced how he, the chicken soup series and stuff like that. So anyway, we won't go too far more into that, but you know, everybody's got their stick of what they believe and what they don't believe, but there's always ties and connections prior in our life. There's no real new information. There's a regurgitation of information and then people are blessed to go and teach it or, you know, in the way that they can articulate information so that people can understand it. So we can have 10 messages and 10 people can tell the same message, part of me, not 10 messages, but 10 people telling the same message and it's interpreted 10 different ways. Right. So right. it's imperative that we have people such as yourself going out and, and sharing. So I appreciate that. So could you share with the listeners some of the steps you take someone through to become a more effective, confident networker? Funny you should use the word step because I actually have an eight step process. So step one is every conversation or every meeting or every conference has to start with an invitation. So that's step one. And one of my quotes, I'm proud to say I've created a few quotes, Dwight. And here's my first one. If you don't go, you'll never know. Or quoting my friend, the film star Woody Allen, 80% of success is just turning up. That's his quote. So step one. Step two is we start to meet people. Step three is we start to build relationships, which is the nub of networking. There are three key steps to building every single relationship, social or business. And the three key steps are Know, like, and trust. Every relationship, uh, you're nodding at me here, but it's absolutely true. Every relationship starts with a no, a K-N-O-W. And I believe that if one person doesn't get on with another person and doesn't like them, the relationship will wither on the vine very, very quickly. People will do everything they can not to develop that relationship. Sometimes we have to, and sometimes we get it wrong. We don't, the, impre the first impressions, we normally get it right, but sometimes we get it wrong. So the second step is like, and the third step is trust. No like, and trust. So once we've started to develop the relationship, step four in my process is asking questions. Once you start talking to people, the number one core skill is to ask great questions. You ask great questions, you'll get great answers. If you're in business development and you ask great questions, the next step in my eight step process is spotting a need. Now this need is either for the other person or it's for yourself, or hopefully often it is both. Somebody, you ask somebody, do you mind me asking you who your accountants are? And they say, oh, well, we're with so-and-so. And you ask uh, what they think about them and they say, well, we're not very happy with them. There's a possibility that there is a need for you as the accountant to take on a new client and a need for the client to take on a new accountant. That is step five. Step six is called the aha moment. The aha moment or the light bulb moment. So I say to everybody, if you no I don't say if value every conversation every conversation ought to have an aha moment in it you gave me an aha moment and I've written it down you said don't say you're old Will tell people you're seasoned that was I love that so that was my aha moment that was step six now if you go networking to create business relationships with a view to doing business, 
Step seven is probably the most important. And that is the follow-up. I Most people are what I call networking criminals, Dwight. They spot an opportunity and they do not follow it up. Or they might half-heartedly follow it up just once. But you know what? The fortune's in the follow-up. That is the key to the whole thing. And step eight is meeting people. So if you go to a, when things go back to normal and we can go physically networking, you meet somebody at an event and you spot the aha moment, that should indicate to your brain that you need to follow this up. And those are the eight steps. That's and awesome. what, I tr- what I try and emphasize very, very strongly is do not mix up networking, i.e. building relationships with selling whatever you do. Do not go selling while you are building relationships. You should never, ever need to sell in today's world. What you're doing, you're asking questions, you're spotting an opportunity, and then you're making proposals. So if I meet you at an event, let's let's go back to my olden day. Well, no, let's go back to my nowadays. And I meet you at an event, and you're head of learning and development of a law firm. And you've said to me, well, we've got a whole load of young lawyers and we can't get them out networking. What do I do? I go, aha. I say, Dwight, please may I have permission, and this is part of the follow-up, please may I have permission to call you later in the week and let's continue our conversation then. And if you think it's relevant, I'll come to your office and we'll find out even more about your law firm. And Dwight will say yes. And when I get to your office, I'm not going to do any selling. I'm going to say, well, Dwight, thanks for seeing me. We do a bit of small talk. Small talk, Dwight, is the glue that creates the relationship. It's never the business talk. It's always the small talk that creates the relationship. So I meet you in your office and I say, do you remember last week, Dwight, at that conference, you said you had a team of young lawyers who needed to learn to network. Tell me about it. And then all I'll do is shut up and take notes. And then all I'll do to you is say, well, what I believe I can do is run a three-hour workshop for your people and they can learn this, this, and this, and the cost will be X. And that's it. I've not done any selling. You've indicated to me in our conversation that you have a need for my services. And it would be wrong of me not to follow you up because I am giving you a gift. I am giving you a gift of my knowledge, my experience, and my expertise, and I'm going to charge you $1,000. But the value I expect you to get from my $1,000 is $10,000 because some of those trainee lawyers are going to become good networkers. So I say to people, if you spot an opportunity to do business with people and you are knowledgeable, have expertise, and have experience, you are doing them a disservice by not following them up. Wow. I love that. Um, and the reason I smiled about, and nodded about no I can trust, I've been teaching on that for a long time. I use those exact words. One of my mentors, um, you'd have to look it up. His name's Jake Ballantyne. Start with a B. So Valentine, with a, but put a B on the front. Jake Ballantyne. He has a a group on a a closed group that anybody can join, but it's 11,000 members now called speakers, authors, and coaches. And he, and I, I belong to his high level mastermind outside of that too. And he focuses and talks about KLT all the time. And you know what he's done over before COVID he's only 35. He's done a thousand speaking engagements. And he started out working in the youth market to teach them how to know, like, and trust, to learn how to network and relationship build. So there's so much, I smiled and nodded, and it, it's never out of disrespect for what you're saying. It's because it resonates with me. I can feel my body just happy because this is the type of person I want on Give a Heck is you, as people that get it. And, and the fact that Give a Heck is about going through life doesn't mean you always struggled. It means you had an epiphany. You had a pivotal moment in your life where you changed and decided you wanted to get into something different and age. Most people in their fifties aren't thinking of doing a pivot like that. So kudos to you. 
Thank you, God, for blessing me, for us to be connected. I'm really enjoying this conversation. So I, I took away a couple things. And I do the same thing in my own career. People don't pitch. The first thing you do when you communicate with me, and I imagine it'd be Will, you send me a message digitally, or you leave me a voicemail, or you call me up. Don't start talking to me about your product before you start finding out who I am and let me know who you are. Let's communicate. Let's figure things out. Let's percolate. Let's find out if there's chemistry. The product should always be the end result, whether it's a service or a physical product. You need yeah. to care about people. I believe the best leaders and the best sellers of products and services are those that understand that they're always serving others and serving their needs and making them feel comfortable within their own circumstances so that they can make better educated choices. But it all starts out from no liking and trust. Right. And people wonder why their businesses, they have a high, lower attention rate. Um, for clients, whether they're an employee working for somebody and their attention's low or they have their own business, it's normally because they did it wrong. It's never too late to change, though, to learn how to give a heck about others. If um, something's happened in the last 48 hours, I've used the word Bichette. I'm going to use it again. I decided, my wife and I decided, we actually, for historical reasons, We've had two financial advisors, which hasn't been the perfect thing. Um, but we've had two financial advisors. One of them's looked after two thirds of our investments and one looked after one third of our investments. But now that we've got all these massive changes, moving house, moving to London, etc., I thought it made sense to consolidate them under one. The, the one, I had to phone him up yesterday to say I was moving all my investments from him to the other one. And I felt bad about it because I've been with him for 40 years, but I had to do it. And he was very nice. And do you know what happened this morning? My son, Michael, the musician, do you remember the musician went to Oxford? Da, da, da. He phones me up and he said, dad, I'm 40 years old. I need to start putting money into pension. Who can you recommend? So I was able to recommend the guy that I'd moved all my investments from to him today. So yeah, that's awesome. although he's, he's lost, he's lost Kintish the elder, he's now going to get Kintish the younger as a new client. Circle How of life. That? Circle of life. That I was really yes, pleased about that, that. That is very so pleasing. The first principle of network, the first principle of the like out of the no like and trust is always, and you've alluded to it many times in this talk, is to be kind, is to be, sh is to share, and is to help people. And for me, that is how I try and live all the t all the time. A beautiful quote from an English poet from 1850, Elizabeth Bibesco. She said the following: "Give without remembering, and receive without forgetting." And I love that. Whenever anybody does me a favor. I do everything I can to repay them somehow. Sometimes it's just sending them a bottle of wine or, or something or, or saying, look, have you, have you got any kids who need help with networking that I can do some training for them for nothing? Um, but the word trust, so many people say, Dwight, well, it takes a long time to build trust. Well, I have a take on it. You can build trust like that. Simple, by being reliable. When I had my office, I work from home now, have done for five years. But before that, I had staff in an office. And in my accountancy days, of course, I had staff. And I said to them, when you want to work with Will Kintish, you only have two things to do. You can make mistakes. You're human. We all make mistakes. But you have to follow Kintish's two rules. Rule one. Do what you say you're going to do. Rule two, do it when you say you're going to do it. Do not let me down. Do not let your colleagues down in the office. And do not let the clients down. Because at the end of the day, and I have to say this, Dwight, 
to the professional, to the accountant, to the lawyer, to the researcher. I do tons with business schools and universities. I say at the end of the day, if you want to build trust, people don't know how clever you are, what a great lawyer you are, what a great accountant you are. They have no concept of it unless they are one themselves. But they do know whether you're a trustworthy person by delivering on time. And, uh, and I, I work so hard at that. I mean, I have a, I have a call in theory at uh, 5.30. If we continue, okay, but I'm going to send the guy who I was due to phone uh, a message saying, sorry, Andrew, uh, I'll speak tomorrow. As long as you warn people in advance that you're not going to make it fine. But just to ignore somebody when you'd arrange to speak to them, to me, that's a terrible human crime. Maybe it really is. I agree. Do you agree with me? Of course, hundred percent. And you shouldn't be getting people notice at the last minute where possible. You try to do it longer period of time. Oh, right? yeah. I mean, this was just a casual conversation Andrew and I were going to have, but even so I said to him yesterday, oh, Andrew, I'll call you about half five tomorrow, but uh, I won't. We'll, I'm loving this conversation. So I'll speak to him tomorrow. I think he wants to sell me something anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, yeah, that's my take on building relationships, know, like, and trust. You know something? If somebody wants to sell me something and I say to them, yeah, I might be interested in that, give me a call between 12 and 3 tomorrow and tell me about it. If they don't call me then, do you know what? The chances of getting my business is very, very tiny. Because if they can't call me to try and sell me something, what are they going to be like when I become a customer of theirs? Well, it's a key indicator of their, of their, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? But it's a, it, it's a key indicator that you're not going to be able to rely on them to do what you said as part of your two rules. They won't, you're right. It's very slim. Um, three. So, well, networking is a, is fundamental to one's success yet so many people fear this activity as you've as you've mentioned and i'm quite familiar with as well what do you believe are some of the reasons people fear reaching out and connecting to others it's very simple if we're talking physical it's fear of rejection and fear of the unknown simple as that most people dwight have got many fears about going to an event and therefore won't do it, and therefore will not develop their career as a result of it. And that's where I come in. I show them how to do it. Let's talk about fear of rejection. Have you heard this acronym, FEAR, F-E-A-R? False expectations appearing real. That's what fear is. So I say to people, what, they say, well, I walk into the room and nobody will talk to me. I say to them, let's call them John or Jack, Jack and Jill. I say, Jack and Jill, I don't care if they don't talk to you. Your job is to go and talk to them. Number one, if you hate working a room, do what I always, always do and get there early. Because when you get there early, you are immediately in command and control of, you, of the situation. Whereas if you get there and the room is matured and the groups are formed and you feel as though there's no way in, no wonder you're scared stiff. But if you get there early, if you plan your day, then it's so easy. You get there, you, there'll often be people standing on their own. You simply go up to them and say, hello, please may I join you? My name's Will, Will Kintish. And you are? I'm Dwight, Dwight Tech. Oh, hi, Dwight. Nice to meet you. Where have you traveled from today? Or... What made you come to this event today? Or isn't this a magnificent room, Dwight? And that's, that's the other thing. You never start off with, hello, nice to meet you. What do you do? Because we've immediately gone into business. Business comes second. I think you said that earlier on. Business comes second. Let's find something we've got in common immediately. So it's, we've both traveled to get there. We're both at an event for a similar reason. We're both in the same environment. So we've got something in common right away. And if you do want to ask people questions, what do you do? How about this one? I believe the Queen Mother, our present Queen's 
late mother who died 20 years ago asked this question. So what keeps you busy all day? Much better than, uh, you, you like that, I can see you're smiling. What keeps you busy all day? Much better than what do you do? And anyway, Dwight, most professional people, when asked what do you do, don't answer properly. They say, I'm a lawyer, I'm an accountant, I'm a professor, I'm a, I'm a regional director. That's what they are, not what they do. People don't care what you do. They only care what you can do for them. So answer the question, what do you do with a verb and not a noun? Think I, about it. I do, because I, I learned that skill a long time ago. Um, as a side note, to, sorry to interrupt you, but I followed somebody. So this started back in early 2000s. Um, his name is Blair Singer. You can actually Google him. He's a famous American and he teaches uh, what they call sales dogs. Um, he's got a program that teaches people how to create that communication to create a more comfortable, what they call elevator pitch. So you're starting with not, I'm an accountant, I'm a finance person. So what do you, Dwight? If somebody says, Dwight, what do you do? Well, I, I help families live better today, retire in comfort and die with dignity. Beautiful. Love it. That's exactly what I say to people when they ask me. And I've been doing that now for 19 years. So I smile because, man, your Congress, this is just amazing. <laughs> I absolutely love this. It's just connecting into my being and who I am and how I serve people. And the listeners know that, right? So thank you for sharing that. The one really is good. fear of rejection. So I say to people, can you imagine going up to somebody at an event and say, hello there, please may I join you? And they look you up and down and say, well, to be honest with you, I don't like the look of you, so get lost. I mean, what are the chances of that? Pretty much zero. And anybody, anyway, Dwight, somebody standing on their own is only standing there on their own for two reasons. Number one, they don't know anybody. And number two, they're scared stiff. So they are, you are the answer to their prayers. You're a religious man. You go up to somebody you have answered their prayers by going up to them. Now, fear of the unknown. This is something that I'm going to share with you. I bet you don't know this one. And your, re your listeners perhaps won't know this. And, I'm going to, and this is for 20 years that I've changed people's lives. And this is, a, this is a big brag that I'm going to tell you. Every room you've ever been in and every room you're ever going to go into for the rest of your lives, social or business, has always formatted in exactly the same way. There are only ever six for ever, only ever six formats of groups in a room. The six groups are as follows. The individual standing on their own, they only ever stand against the wall. They don't stand in the middle of the room. They stand against the wall, hovering, waiting for you or me to go and talk to them. That's number one. Number two, we have couples, men, we generally stand in open format, in a V-shape. Women stand in closed format, like two parallel lines. Women, when they're talking to other people, whether it's men or women, face the person they're talking to. We men, particularly when we're talking to other men, are uncomfortable being so close. You watch this. When you go back networking, I want you to get back to me and say, do you know what, Will, you're absolutely right. So those are three formats. The fourth format are trios. Men normally stand in a quason, in a semicircle. Women stand in a triangle. So that's groups five and four and five. And then you get the scariest group of all, as I call it, the group of four or more. The group of four or more, if it's a four, they stand in a square. It's a five or six or seven, they stand in a circle. So when you walk into that room, from now on, you will notice three open groups, the ones, the open twos, the open three, their body language is saying, come on, come and join us. The other groups, unless you know somebody in there is saying, at this moment, stay away. It's like, a, it's, yeah, they're not warm and welcoming. And as you're talking about this, I can... But I can think about this in rooms that I've been in myself and it, 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 it triggered something in me. It triggered a body response. And that's why I said it's, it doesn't, to me, it, looking at that in a closed circle of seven, eight people, I don't feel welcome to go over 
unless I do know somebody. So I'm agreeing with you. I completely can understand that. The, um, having said that, sorry, the sun's just coming in. The best group to join is a closed formatted group if there is somebody in there. Because if I'm in a group with four others and you approach me and tap me on the shoulder and say, hi, Will, can I join you? Dwight, great to see you. Hi, come in. Hi, everybody. This is Dwight. Dwight, introduce yourself to them. And off we go. So we, we brought you into the group. You, you, I, I, hope like you will know, I hope you will know this lady's name. We've talked about a lot of third parties tonight. Have you heard of Maya Angelou? No. Oh, I haven't. Check her out. Maya Angelou, very, very famous American, died in 2014. She wrote five autobiographies, all of them world bestsellers. Did she have a colorful life? I can't tell you. And what I say to my audience is that networking, particularly working a room, is nothing to do with business. It's to do with kindness and liking. And she said, she said this just before she died. As I look back over my life, I've forgotten what people said to me and I forgot what people did to me, but I never forgot how people made me feel. So what I say to my audience is, when you leave every encounter, so for example, if you've had a nice chat with that individual against the wall, by just then saying to them, well, Dwight, it's nice to have met you and walking off, you are not going to feel good and you're definitely not going to feel good about me. So how do I get rid of you? I offer you an option. Dwight, I'm going for a drink. Would you like to join me? Dwight, I've seen my friend Janice over there. Let me introduce you. The important thing is that you move them off the space. The longer you stand on that space, the more the silence will increase. However... If their body language starts to look over your shoulder, they start looking round because you realize both of you, you both realize the conversation has come to an end. If they start doing that, that is rude. And what you are, I am giving you license to do the following. So if you've been rude to me, I will say to you, well, Dwight, it's nice to have met you, enjoy the event. I call that the dump, I've dumped you. However, if you've been very polite and I realize you don't know anybody, I will offer you that option of taking you for a drink or taking you for food or introducing you to Janice. But what happens if there's no Janice and I don't know anybody and you don't know anybody? Are you ready for this one? Come on, Dwight, let us go and meet some others. In other words, take that person with you, go and find an open two or an open three and go and break into, into those groups and join that group. So it's all about kindness. It's all about thinking, I do not want this person who knows nobody to feel uncomfortable about me. So I will take them into that group and then leave them there. I've done my charity job for the night. I will leave them and then probably go off and, and leave them to it. I love you saying that. I, I, I coach people quite often and my clients included that your whole goal when you meet somebody or even if it's somebody that you've known for a long time, you should always hope that you both leave that encounter wanting to see the other person again, that you can't wait to have another encounter, another conversation, whether it's on the phone, face to face. And that if you strive, listeners, if you strive to live a life where you're always kind to people and you always want to leave them better than they were when you started the encounter or vice versa, you want to feel better. If you circle yourself with people in your life and your associations are built based on the principle of being kind and leaving them feeling and wanting more of you and this, you feeling the same, you will have some of the best associations and relationships, the re relationships the rest of your life. And back to what you talked about that author may and how to make, you know, you don't care about all the details. You'll remember how they made you feel. Just think of your whole life, if your associations are always, you know, your goal is to always leave them wanting more and you expecting the same, 
you will have a very fulfilled life. It won't matter what they sold you. If they ever did, it won't matter what they did specifically. You know, if it's even a, you know, they built a deck for you, they're a contractor, but you don't think about that. You think about it. Well, whenever they showed up, they were so nice to me. They'd ask about the kids. They'd play with the dog. They just, and I haven't seen that person since they built a deck 15 years ago. But I'm always going to remember that feeling when I think I look at my deck right now, I can think I'm using it as an example, because the guy that built my deck, I have that kind of connection. I can't wait to see him again. Absolutely. You know what I mean? I, so. I say exactly the same. I say, I want you to leave a group or leave an individual with that person thinking what a great guy Will Kintish was. That's all. And the next best thing I like about this is when I connect with somebody and you alluded to this, taking that person and going over to that group of two or three and you, you, you bring them with you. I like connecting people. So when I know people, for an example, I did a podcast uh, interview a few days ago and I've started connect, I'm gonna, this person. I'm going to connect him to a bunch of other people. He's relatively new. He doesn't know. He doesn't have the network I have. And I feel it's my responsibility when I know I like, can trust somebody when they leave me with that feel good circumstance to continue to serve them and help them so that they can spread their message. They can go out and effectively help more people. Right. So I believe that in a village mentality, which is what I believe in, we're always looking to serve no matter if we're at the top of the pecking order or the person that's at the bottom of the pecking order. We always can serve people and help lift them up and continue to level up in their own lives. And they can be fearful, right? So we as, as leaders of others in regards to education and wanting to uplift people, I believe we have a responsibility to always connect people, right? So for an example, I can think of people right now that would be great for you to be on their podcast, right? Because to spread the message of what you're talking about and their listenership will fit that mold. And how do I know that? Because some of those podcasters have been on my show. Some of those podcasters are good friends of mine, or I've been on their shows, right? So it's my prior knowledge of what their experience is getting to know you and I can meld them and say, this is, there's enough connection points that will deserves to meet these people. Right. So listeners always want to serve That's bottom it. line. Simple as that. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. Only today, Sarah in my networking club, um, said, Will, do you know a guy called Robert? I said, I know Robert. So I'm going to put the two of them together. And as it happens, they can both they can do they can sell things to each other interestingly enough so that is a perfect synergy uh, yeah where yeah, they can perfect. where you can collaborate that's amazing but but you know do you know something that um have you heard of the chemical in our body called dopamine mm -hmm. you know, it's a it's a chemical up here somewhere that is the pleasure chemical yeah. it makes us feel good and I, I say to people, if you want to, this is, this is a bit ironic, really. If you want to make people feel good, ask them to help you. Because if they're able to help you, they will feel good and the chemical will be created. So I love helping people because I know it makes me feel good. I mean, just think about Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. They're giving billions and billions of dollars away. Now, you know the word altruism, don't you? Altruism means you give without receiving anything back. I cannot believe that those two guys, they are giving the money away. What are they going to get back? That warm, fuzzy feeling inside that they're going to save millions of people in the world. So I don't believe there's such a thing as altruism because we always get something from it, even if it's just that chemical created in our brain. Well, oh, that's a powerful chemical. Absolutely. So... We're going to continue on. So far, the conversation is uh, we could go on and on <laughs> about every single thing we've talked about. But I want to I want the listeners to learn some more about you. So, well, you're the author of Business Networking, the survival guide, how to make networking less about stress and more about success. What challenges did you face taking this from thought to paper? And did you have many critics along the way putting it together? Robert Bichette, 
In 2014, I wrote a book and self-published it called I Hate Networking. And in about two or three years later, I get a, an email from a, a massive publishing company saying, Dear Mr. Kintish, we know all about you. Will you write a book on networking? So I had to go back to them and say, well, you haven't checked me out very well because I've already got a book on networking. It's on Amazon. I said, um, maybe you'd like to publish it. So I met Eloise from Pearson Publishing, which is a massive company. And sorry, the sun, I'm going to have to move it. And we met, we met at uh, a train station in London and I gave her the book. And she took it away and she said, um, I just love that book. She said, it needs some alteration. I said, OK, um, what do you want to do? I said, first of all, I asked her, are you going to give me a royalty, uh, an advance in royalty? She said, yeah, no problem. And she gave me a nice royalty. And do you know what she then did? She took my book called I Hate Networking changed it around a bit and published the book that you've just mentioned. So I didn't have to do anything. I'd already written the book years earlier, gives me a, a royalty, rewrites it to, into her format, but she was very good because she picked up all the nuances from my original book and put it into this, into the book here. So again, maybe I'm just a very lucky guy, Dwight. I don't know. Uh, you know what? My listener is going to laugh at this because I learned this from a guy back in the early 90s, standing on stage at a conference in Salt Lake City, Utah. And he said, and I'll never forget Dexter saying this. Dexter said, you know what? Luck is a loser's excuse for a winner's completion. And it has res resonated with me my whole life because luck and preparation, right, are together. Because yeah. a person, in order to be lucky, have to be prepared mentally yeah. to understand opportunity and then seize it. And if people want to call that lucky, that's fine. But, um, yeah. and again, it's not to insult people, but luck, I don't believe in luck. I believe in preparation. I believe in the fact of seizing carpe diem, seizing the day and understanding opportunity, having the right associations to help me level up so I can visualize and interpret and bring on more opportunity because maybe I was too closed minded. Right. So my associations helped me become more lucky air quotes for the people that are because I this this as my listeners. So you can watch this on YouTube too. I have a YouTube channel, but most people listen to it. So air quotes around the fact of being lucky. I believe that it's preparation. I, I don't think you were lucky. I think you were very attuned to wanting to adapt, change, serve others. And the book going from there to a publisher to you getting you know paid money was all meant to happen. It just okay. was meant it was meant to happen. I don't think it was luck. I think it was just initial work, your preparation that led you to that point in your life right? Because you, Absolutely. the publisher could have reached out to you and you could have just shrugged it off, right? So then I, what does luck have to do with that? I have another quote for you from Will Kintish. Yeah. Strateg strategy for survival is visibility. Good. I like so that. So anybody who's in a small business, I say to them, how visible are you? And how proactive are you? Because unless you're BMW or, or you're um, Coca-Cola or McDonald's, who've got billions of dollars to, to spend what, telling us all about themselves on posters and the TV and the cinema, we're all a secret. So the only way, the, the only way uh, to get known is to be visible. And when, when a, a world-class publishing company says, Will, would you like to publish a book? Even if they'd offered me nothing, I would have said yes, because it was publicity. I never told her that at the time, of course. <laughs> That's awesome. If you don't ask, you don't give the other person an opportunity to say yes. 
So I ask, and that's something else. My friend Andy Laparta has just written a book called Just Ask. It's a great book. And I'm talking to people all the time about this. Have you heard this quote? Fear is temporary and regret is permanent. And in fact, I'm doing a talk tomorrow night to a whole load of young people with that title about fear of not asking questions, fear of not following up, fear of not, uh, not going networking. And my job is to say, these are your fears, but let me tell you how to overcome them. So, for example, when it's about follow, why don't people follow up? It's the same old thing. They're bound to say no. They think I'm going to annoy them. And I say, no, you're following up for a mutual benefit. Yeah. So, that's well, you know, and I love the fact that you talk about fear. Fear has got so many different acronyms. You know, I like the fact that now when I hear the word fear, I think of the other ones, the other acronyms, but the one that stands out in my mindset the most is face everything and rise, right? So instead of thinking of it as false evidence appearing real or any of the other acronyms, I think of it always as face everything and rise. Okay, right? I'll take that. Because, because I also, and you'll find it in some of my earlier things that I've written and posted over the last, I'd say 30 years, I teach people this and it's for specifically because I believe that people under have to understand faith too. So for me, here's something that I say to people, very simple. This is a Dwightism, I guess you would call it, um, right? Fear knocked at the door, faith answered, and no one was there. Uh. And I want the listeners that are new to the show or that are been listening and I've inquired, uh, challenge people to think about that. I want you to put some actual thought into what I just said. I'll say it again. Fear knocked at the door, faith answered, and no one was there. So then if you tie that back to the fact of thinking about fear being face everything and rise, you start conditioning your mind to be a positive person, to be that critical thinker that can take a negative, pivot it, and always think about the positive side of it, it drove my kids crazy because I used to always, I still do it today, talking to my adult son yesterday, he turned 22 and we were having a conversation and, I, and he was telling me something. I said, okay. And I, and I want to understand how to use, I've become a wordsmith. So saying things certain ways to get the exact same res, like result can be done if you understand how words can empower us to trigger things in people's mindset, as you mentioned, right? Dopamine hits and stuff like that. So I think of fear, again, face everything and rise, faith knocked at the door, fear answered, and no one was there, right? And I tie those two together. And when people talk about fear, those two things automatically come into my mindset. Not any of the other acronyms, but I've had to, you know, I didn't wake up one day like this. The listeners know that I'm a, I'm a work in project. I'm going to be till the day I take my last breath. Right? People say to me, why aren't you going to retire? Will?" I say to them, number one, I'm an incurable self confessed workaholic, but more importantly than that, Dwight, every day is my birthday. That's another thing I do differently. I don't use the word birthday. I use the word born day. Blonde. Born. My born, born day. day. I don't say happy birthday to people. I'm not saying it to be cute or funny because pe some people think it is. Every time that I hit another birthday, I'm reborn. I've been given another shot, another year, right? I've been blessed to be on this planet. So my born day. So Will, if you had to give our listeners one last closing message, what would you tell them in regards to giving a heck and never giving up? What's the worst that can happen by going into a room? What's the worst that can happen if you ask that killer question? What's the worst that can happen following up a lead? And the answer is nothing will happen. Well, if you started off with nothing, it can't get any worse. That's that's amazing. That's a great last last message to leave the leave to the listeners. Um, yeah, exactly. What is the worst can, that can happen? And I talk that about that to people as well. 
again, it's all about that fear, right? People get gripped by it. They don't have enough faith. They don't know how to drive fear out of them. Lack of associations, poor current associations. And again, as one side note, and then we're going to wrap this up. Associations just aren't people. I talk about this in my own book. I talk about this in my coaching practice. Associations are what you're feeding into your mind through the media, whether it's television, radio, social media. It's what are what kind of books are you reading or listening to? What kind of podcasts are you listening to? If you're feeling bad, don't listen to things that are going to exaggerate your state of mind. Don't listen to negative things. Don't listen to sad music. Don't listen or watch movies or TV. Understanding entertainment's not bad. The choices of what you ingest and put into your mindset are what the challenge are. So in order for you to continue to level up, do a hard look at your associations Look at what you're doing and feeding yourself. Somewhere along there is a key of why you're being held back by your own choice, though, right? Your own choice is to be held back because once you've heard me talk and Will and our conversation now, you should have some hope and faith that there's great people out there that can help. And now it's your responsibility to check your associations, reach out to either Will or myself, and maybe we can, you know, I can't promise we can help you level up because it all starts with you, right? Stepping out on faith, right? So, well, our time is almost up and I want to respect our listeners in your time. However, before we end, can you please tell the listeners what is the best way to reach you, Will? Well, I have a website that I'm very proud of, Kintish, K-I-N-T-I-S-H dot co dot U-K or LinkedIn. Uh, I'm very proud of this, Dwight. I know we're going very quickly, but in, in 2010, I bought a website for $10 called linkedintraining.co.uk. And I did training in LinkedIn for five years. And this guy said to me in 2015, Will, I'd love to buy your website. I said, make me an offer. And he made me an offer. So for the next five years, he paid me 12 and a half percent of everything he earned for the next five years, which was quite good for a $10 investment, wasn't it? As a financial advisor, you'll be proud of that, won't you, Dwight? ROR, um, good. <laughs> so LinkedIn, LinkedIn is my big thing. But listeners, if you write to me and invite me to LinkedIn, please don't commit the LinkedIn crime of sending me an invitation without a personal message telling me where you met me. So it's there, you go to my profile, you press the connect button and it says, add a note and it'll say, there will, can we connect? We met on the Dwight Heck show and I'd love to connect with you. And that way I'll know that you're a good person and not just a stranger come out of the darkness. I love that. That is so true. And I'm guilty of that too, accepting people on Facebook, on um, LinkedIn, Instagram. Since my book went become a bestseller in March of this year, I get inundated with connections. I get What's inundated with DMs. I get inundated with people that want to be on my podcast and they don't add anything personal. And I'm just as guilty. I should be doing it. Um, so thank you for the reminder. I appreciate that so much. And I, and I, I'm sure our listeners will as well. So thanks so much for being on. Give a heck, Will. I appreciate your time and sharing some of your experiences so that others too can learn it is never too late to give a heck. Thank you for taking time out of your day and listening to Give a Heck. If you find value, I'd appreciate you sharing with your friends and family so they too can learn how to live life on purpose, not by accident. So you do not miss the next episode. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and please also post a review. I look forward to reading your comments. This has been Dwight Heck. If you want to check out other podcast episodes or today's show notes, please check out my website, giveaheck.com. And until next time, Together, let us all strive to give a heck.